a live event to tell you about during this quorum call. Coming up in about 45 minutes over on C-SPAN 3, New Jersey Governor Chris Christie will be speaking at the American Enterprise Institute. His speech is titled, It's Time to Do the Big Things. He'll talk about spending reductions and restoring fiscal health. We've got an online hub for all things budget related. Take a look at cspan.org slash budget.
The Senate is in a quorum call. Today they're continuing work on federal aviation programs. A number of amendments are pending on that bill. Negotiations continue on several provisions, including how many long-distance flights are allowed from Washington, D.C.'s Reagan Airport and funds for lesser-used air service in states like Alaska. Meanwhile, the House is also in session today. Currently, members are considering a Senate change to extending expiring Patriot Act provisions. Those provisions include business records, roving wiretaps, and individual terrorists acting as agents of foreign powers. The Senate shortened the length of the extension. It's now through May rather than December. You can watch the House, as always, live on C-SPAN. President. Senator from West Virginia. I ask unanimous consent that the order of the quorum call be rescinded. Without objection. I ask unanimous consent that the Senate resume consideration of the Baucus Amendment number 75 as further modified. This is, this is the amendment for the finance title of the bill that we're on, which was reported out by the Finance Committee last week. Further, that the agreement as further modified be agreed to and the motion to reconsider be laid upon the table with no intervening action or debate. Is there objection? Without objection, so ordered. Mr. President. Senator from Washington. Mr. President, I come to the floor today to um, comment. I've heard both the chairman and the ranking member this morning giving comments about the FAA bill. And first of all, I want to thank them for their hard work and diligence in this legislation. It doesn't just come now this year. Uh, this is something that the chairman and ranking member have been working on for several years. And uh, I had a chance yesterday to talk about the next gen system and how many jobs are going to be created from really high wage uh, technology that is going to be used to modernize our transportation system. It's going to deliver flights that are probably 20% more on time. It's going to save us 5 to 6% on fuel. It's going to lower CO2, and it's going to uh, improve the experience for passengers. So I'm all for the FAA underlying bill, and uh, I applaud them for their hard work in trying to make this legislation a reality and doing so this week. Um, I do have concerns about the proposed uh, Hutchison Amendment, and I know that the senator from Texas indicated that she is still talking with people and working with people and um, wanted to make everyone happy. And in this place, I don't think you make everyone happy, but I applaud the senator's uh, willingness to at least on the floor say she's trying to work to make everyone happy, and I think she's probably sincere in her efforts. Uh, I, I do have a concern, having been involved with this issue now probably for three or four years myself, not just the FAA bill, but the slots issue and air transportation. And uh, my former colleague, Senator Gordon Smith from Oregon, and I were involved in this issue and several years before that uh, with numerous other com members of the Commerce Committee. It is probably one of the thornier issues that Congress has to deal with, and primarily because um, the issue uh, is one that's fused both by issues of economic development around airports, also uh, transportation interests of the flying public, and probably a little bit of dose of what members, you know, own personal experiences and interests are. 
But for me, uh, getting access to the West, to the nation's capital, is an important issue. Uh, it's not the primary way I come to work every week. Um, I actually uh, fly in and out of the other airport in the region and uh, do so, I don't know if I'd say happily, because frankly, I think Dulles Airport is, I don't know what they've done lately with their new, uh, you know, they got rid of their mobile lounges and now uh, invested in some transport system that you probably walk as far on that system as, as you do what the previous system is. I see people smiling on the floor because I think they've already been through it. I think they're, I think they're saying, yeah, I've, I've done that drill and what, what, what's up at Dulles? But that aside, um, that's the way I fly 80% of the time back and forth to the nation's capital and am uh, pleased to have that flight schedule that accommodates me and actually accommodates many Washingtonians because I think there's probably many of my Washingtonians who are coming back to the region to do business on a variety of issues in that corridor and, uh, and, and see that as an access point as well. The issue though is about whether the West has enough access to, Dulles, to uh, National Airport and uh, in the past two debates that we've had on this issue in 2000 and 2003 the Congress decided the West did not have enough access to National Airport. And in both of those instances, this body passed legislation opening up more slots to the West through a process that the Department of Transportation basically decided what were the best areas of the West to service, who were the best networks to possibly service those areas, and how to get that traffic from one destination to the nation's capital. In both instances, 2000 and in 2003, that uh, very broad directive was given to the Department of Transportation. Each time, six new flight uh, paths were opened up to the nation's capital. And I think that that process worked very well. It worked very well because the debate was not here in the United States Senate floor about whose service was going to be uh, delivered, but it was given to the Department of Transportation and the broad outline. In each instance, uh, increasing access to the West, to the nation's capital, is about uh, having the flying public access the nation's capital, and it's also about economic interests. And that's why I still have concerns about this proposal on the table and about the fair access that it is, uh, uh, may not provide to many uh, people in the West. This particular proposal, unlike the two previous um, access issues in 2000 and 2003, where in each point six new slots were given and the Department of Transportation had a fair and open process about it, this particular proposal focuses on the uh, airlines that already service the nation's capital. And in this case, over 60% of the nation's capital uh, slots are controlled by two specific airlines. This proposal would open um, those carriers' ability to trade out swaps that they already, slots that they already have uh, with other uh, cities and thereby giving them access to the West. In fact, uh, my colleague from Texas's proposal even on those new slots and new incumbent carriers that they're saying can give access uh, to the West are people who are currently operating even with inside the perimeter today. So uh, if you think that this proposal is about helping access uh, the West, it is primarily about accessing the West for people who already control uh, the real estate at National Airport, which is two carriers. Now, I noticed that um, the Department of Justice has looked at this larger issue. That's because uh, for many of my colleagues who I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, I'm, I'm actually, um, uh, oh, I guess I'm glad I'm educated on it, but I wish, wish I had, had, had time to work on other things. The issue is that the national interest or policy question comes into play when you have access to what are limited footprint destinations, like National Airport, like LaGuardia, uh, those are times when uh, the United States government has said we want to make sure that there is a fair process about this because there's a small pr footprint and obviously if somebody controls too much of that footprint, it's an issue. So in the most recent debate, um, Delta Airlines and U.S. Air have been trying to do a s swap exchange between LaGuardia 
and uh, DCA, and the Department of Justice has basically said, not such a good idea. You already own too much of the market share. If you guys want to do something like this, why don't you divest some of the slots that you have now? And uh, instead of doing that, the airlines, I think, are going to go down you know, a path of continuing to try to accumulate and dominate uh, here in the, in the East. So I, I hope my colleagues will take into consideration that I know the chairman and the ranking member are trying to work in good faith both on this issue and to move the bill forward. But for this member who wants to see a healthy transportation network, I am very concerned about the existing incumbents at National Airport to continue to dominate with 60% of the market uh, and perhaps cancel a lot of flights that they currently have now within this region uh, only to uh, benefit from the more lucrative long-haul flights across the country. Now, I'm for a fair process. I think everybody should be able to bid on any new flights that are going to be put on the table. And I think that the two processes that Congress followed in 2000 and 2003 were closer to what I believe, personally, uh, is a more fair and open process. So I hope that we can you know, continue in working and dialoguing on these issues. I, I, um, I do think they're important. They're probably more important for the long run of what the transportation network and system looks like in this country to make sure that, that the consumer interests are taken care of and that there is a, um, a, a fair and competitive price. And I know, that, uh, I know that some of the people who've been involved in this debate, probably not here on the floor, but you know, out in the public, are talking about the amount of money that certain airlines have invested into these airports, as if you know, somehow that means that they own the airports. Well, I think the facts will show in both of these cases, the majority of money poured into the infrastructure at both of these facilities are basically taxpayer dollars through bonding authority. So it is not as if some airline owns the rights, owns the ability uh, to control 50 or 60 percent of one of these airports just because they have been paid for airport improvements. We've all been paying for airport improvements. And as I said, uh, me personally think the airport improvements that made at Dulles aren't really so much of an improvement, but I'm going to continue to live with that and continue to fly through that particular airport. So I hope my colleagues will keep discussing um, this issue and uh, hope that we can get somewhere on it. Uh, Mr. President, my concern is that a proposal with conversion in it uh, will mean many of my colleagues here on the Senate floor will have their flights canceled to their favorite uh, locations and basically they'll start servicing long haul across the country with a very big share of the existing national market. Uh, I hope we can do something that will instigate more competition, more diversity, and something that uh, will help get this legislation passed. I thank the President and I yield the floor. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Akaka.
A live event to tell you about during this quorum call here in the Senate. Treasury Secretary Timothy Geithner will be speaking in front of the House Budget Committee today at 2 p.m. Eastern. You can watch that live on C-SPAN 3. Secretary of Defense Gates and um, uh, Admiral Mullen are currently testifying at the House Armed Services Committee. You can watch that on C-SPAN 3. Tomorrow, they'll be in front of the Senate Armed Services Committee speaking about their fiscal 2012 defense budget. That's starting at 9.30 a.m. Eastern. Again, that's tomorrow on C-SPAN 3. Also tomorrow on C-SPAN 3, Secretary Napolitano will be at the Senate Homeland Security Committee, and that will be starting at 2.30 p.m. Eastern tomorrow.
You're watching the Senate floor live here on C-SPAN 2. Senators continue work today on a bill reauthorizing Federal Aviation Administration programs. Amendment votes are possible throughout the day. A live event to tell you about coming up in about 15 minutes over on C-SPAN 3. New Jersey Governor Chris Christie will be speaking at the American Enterprise Institute here in Washington. His speech is titled, It's Time to Do the Big Things, and he'll talk about spending reductions and restoring fiscal health. C-SPAN now has an online hub for all things budget-related. You can read the President's proposal that was just released on Monday, get department-by-department -department breakdowns, and watch all budget hearings anytime. That's available for you at cspan.org slash budget.
President. Senator from Wyoming. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, uh, today I come to the floor because the... Uh, we are in a oh, quorum call. Uh, th thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, I ask that the uh, quorum call be vitiated. Without objection. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I ask unanimous consent that I be allowed to speak as if in morning business. Without objection. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, Mr. President, I come to the floor today because on Monday, uh, President Obama introduced his new budget. Uh, and uh, what we saw in that budget is that, uh, for the most part, it's more of the same. Uh, more spending, more taxes, more borrowing. And uh, we see this budget uh, from a president who doesn't seem to understand the, the gravity of the nation's fiscal crisis. The, uh, when you start digging down into that budget that the president proposed, uh, and looking into the uh, Internal Revenue Service component of that budget, what you see is that the uh, Internal Revenue Service is starting to focus in and audit Obamacare. There is a glaring difference in the budget this year from previous years because it is a, the President's new health spending law. Uh, the IRS now has... Uh, In fact, when you take a look at this budget, and specifically the Internal Revenue Service's fiscal year 2012 budget request, over 250 times, Mr. President, over 250 times, the Affordable Care Act, known in the budget as the ACA, known by people all across the country as Obamacare, is mentioned 250 times. You know, Mr. President, the goal uh, to me of the health care law has been to let for people all across this country get the care they need from the doctors that they want at a price they can afford. Um, you know, as, as a member of my party, looking at our economy, looking at the deficit, and looking at the, uh, the, the incredible debt, what, what I think we need to do is make it cheaper and easier, cheaper and easier to create private sector jobs in this country. That's the way we get the economy going again. But when I read this budget, and specifically the IRS requests, it seems to me it's making it harder and more expensive to create private sector jobs in our country. You know, the people of this country are not taxed too little. The problem is that the, governor, the government spends too much. And when I take a look at this budget, that is exactly what I'm seeing being rejected by this administration because it seems that this administration is more interested in taxing, in raising taxes, rather than cutting spending. So when you, you take a look at what the IRS says in the, in the budget, it says the implementation of the Affordable Care Act of 2010 presents a major challenge to the Internal Revenue Service. This is the IRS talking about the law that was crammed down the throats of the American people in the middle of the night written behind closed doors. We're all familiar with it. Now it is presenting a major challenge to the Internal Revenue Service. The Internal Revenue Service goes on to say that this law re represents the largest set of tax law changes in more than 20 years, with more than 40 provisions that amend the tax laws. The Wall Street Journal reported earlier this week that the budget gives the IRS the ability to hire five thousand new workers. Five thousand new workers. After taking a close look at the IRS's plans, we know that they will have to hire over a thousand, a thousand new IRS bureaucrats, Washington bureaucrats, to implement Obamacare measures. And what are some of those that now we're going to have IRS agents coming and looking into? Well, one is the tanning tax. The, the component that promotes compliance with the new excise tax on tanning facilities. The IRS is requesting another $11.5 million and requesting 81 more full-time equivalents to go ahead and implement this tanning tax. For oversights, they call it strength and oversight of exempt hospitals. Mr. Mr. President, these are tax-exempt hospitals, hospitals that don't pay taxes. But to do an oversight of these hospitals, they want another $9.9 million and another 84 full-time employees. 
and information, the new health coverage information reporting. They want $34 million and 100 new full-time employees. Something I call Obamacare 101, assisting taxpayers in understanding the new provisions. The IRS is requesting $22.2 million in hiring another 150 full-time equivalents. And then, of course, the call centers. The IRS call centers so that if someone has a question, they can call in, ask a question. They want another $15 million because of the complexity of this new health care law that's going to be difficult for people to understand. You know, the, the American people and small business owners, and those are the job creators of this country, Mr. President, they want the IRS to make their lives easier, not tougher, not audit their health care choices and their health care decisions. But adding hundreds of new jobs, millions of dollars to the IRS, isn't going to make care better. It's not going to make care more available for anyone. So I'm going to continue to come to the floor with the doctor's second opinion to fight to repeal and replace this health care law and to do it with patient-centered reforms that help the private sector, not the IRS, create more jobs. You know, Mr. President, this morning we had a little event called uh, Wyoming Wednesday where people from Wyoming who are here come together in Senator Enzi's office and we have coffee and donuts and visit. And one of the people here from Wyoming said, you know, I saw a sign and it was worrisome. I said, what was the sign? He said, it said that uh, this location where they're putting in offices used to be a parking lot. You know, when you're replacing a parking lot with more offices for more Washington bureaucrats, that's not a good sign for the rest of America. So here we have the IRS saying that we are dealing with a major challenge because of the health care law. It represents the largest tax law change in more than 20 years. More than 40 provisions are used to amend the tax, are being amended in the tax law and to go after things that they want this kind of money to implement the tax changes with regard to the indoor tanning services, 81 new full-time equivalents, and you may say, well, what's involved in this? Well, the, the IRS says there are as many as 25,000 businesses that provide indoor tanning services that they're now going to tax, including about 10,000 businesses that offer tanning services along with other services such as spas, health clubs, and beauty salons. Well, I mean, it's so interesting. We're standing here in the United States Senate. We're standing here in Congress, 9% unemployment in this country, people looking for work, and more government jobs are being created, and these people are creating government jobs to make it harder on small businesses. And it gets right to the crux of it right here because the IRS even says these entities, all these tanning entities, typically do not have experience filing federal excise tax returns. So what's the government going to do? Come in, make them file claims and forms they don't have experience with, going to be costly, going to take time, going to be taxed. That's not a way to create new jobs. It's so interesting to look at this whole issue of they want 10, 10 million more dollars to spend to strengthen the oversight on tax-exempt hospitals. Mr. President, these are tax-exempt hospitals. Why are the American taxpayers being asked to pay another 10 million dollars to hire 84 full-time equivalents to deal with tax-exempt hospitals? Well, because according to the, uh, the, the law that was crammed down the throats of the American people, the IRS is now required to review at least every three years the, the benefit activities of tax-exempt hospital organizations, which number about 5,100 in this country. They actually say in the, in, in the budget request by the IRS as part of the President's budget that was submitted on Monday, it says these are new requirements for tax-exempt hospitals which include a majority of hospitals in the United States. So we're going, to increase the, we're going to increase taxpayer dollars going for more IRS auditors and making it harder and more burdensome on the tax-exempt hospitals in terms of paperwork and what they need to do. The, uh, it, it, it goes on and on, Mr. Pr Mr. President, and that's why the American people are fed up with what's happening in Washington. And you know, you look into the President's budget, and, and before getting to the one part that has to do with the Class Act, let's talk a little bit about that because there's a whole component of the budget wanting 30 staff members added to the Health Department office 
overseeing implementation of what's called the CLASS Act. It stands for Community Living Assistance Services and Supports. Well, the President's own Debt Commission, remember the President appointed this commission about a year ago to say, let's look into the debt. And people thought that was a bold move, bipartisan group, a lot of people coming together to take a look at this debt. And for a year, the President said, well, we have a debt commission looking into this, so he didn't, didn't deal with the debt. And then now that the Debt Commission came out with its report in December, the President has mostly ignored it. But yet the, the Debt Commission, it was bipartisan, uh, chaired by Erskine Bowles, a former uh, Chief of Staff of the White House for Bill Clinton, and Al Simpson, a former Senator from my home state of Wyoming, they came out and they took a look at the health care law and specifically honed in on this class act, which one of the members of this Senate, a colleague on the opposite side of the aisle, someone who voted for the health care law called a Ponzi scheme that Bernie Madoff would be proud of. The President's Budget Commission, the Bipartisan Budget Commission looked at it and they have significant concerns about the sustainability of the program and called the program to either be repealed or reformed because it is not sustainable. They have raised concerns. People on both sides of the aisle have been raised concerns, but yet the Secretary of Health and Human Services has in her budget money for 30 additional staff members added to the health department offices. Why? To go over the details of this act that people say ought to be repealed because, as it says, the details of the Class Act will, they want to spend $93.5 million in forming and educating people about the Class Act. Well, I can tell them right now, it's unsustainable, it's irresponsible, and it's something that should be repealed. But yet the Department of Health and Human Services wants to spend over $93 million of taxpayer money to inform and educate the public about this component of the health care law that people on both sides of the aisle think needs to go away. Now, Mr. President, finally I will tell you today as someone who believes this health care law is bad for patients, bad for providers, the nurses and doctors who take care of those patients, and, and bad for the taxpayers, that what we saw in the President's budget that came out Monday, coming out for next year, asking for over a thousand new IRS agents to go ahead and implement the, po the various components and responsibilities that have been put upon their heads by this health care law, this is only the beginning. Because the, the entire health care law doesn't really come into full play until 2014. And that's when Americans are going to have more IRS agents, more money being spent, looking into their own personal lives, looking into what kind of insurance they have, is it acceptable to the government, is it government approved? And that's why Senator Graham and I have introduced a piece of legislation called the State Health Care Choice Act to let states decide. Let states decide if Washington ought to be telling the people in their states that they must buy, that every individual must buy government approved insurance. Let the states make that decision. Let the states opt out if they'd like. Let states decide if everyone in their state, all the businesses, must provide government approved insurance to their workers. Let the states decide whether Medicaid, a program for low-income Americans, which is being expanded significantly by cramming 16 million more Americans into Medicaid, which governors all across the country, in a bipartisan way, are saying, our states can't afford this. When a New York Times story shows pictures of Jerry Brown from California and Andrew Cuomo from New York complaining about the mandates that Medicaid is putting on their states, the additional weight and the burden on the people of their states in terms of taxes, in terms of the mandates and what it's going to do for the people of the state who are trying to educate their kids and the cost and the, the pressure on education dollars because they're getting shifted to Medicaid, the cost of, uh, of, of dollars shifted away from public safety, from firefighters, from police officers, uh, other public, sa surf, uh, public uh, safety officers. This health care law, I think people at the state level ought to be able to decide that, no, we don't want this to apply to us. 
And that's why, Mr. President, I come today again as a physician who practiced medicine in Wyoming for a quarter of a century, took care of thousands and thousands of patients and families, trying to help people get better, all in a way that now I think is being taken in the wrong direction by this health care law, and why I think we want to continue to look for ways to make sure people get the care they want from the doctors that they need at a price they can afford. The health care law that was passed by this body fails in, in all of those respects. And now we see with the President's budget a request for money for another thousand IRS agents, not to help people get better, not to help people get the care they need the, from a doctor they want at a cost they can afford. No, not at all, but to audit the health care of the American people. Thank you, Mr. President. I yield the floor. The absence, I suggest the absence of a quorum. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Okaka.
You're watching the Senate Floor Live here on C-SPAN 2. We've got a live budget hearing to tell you about. It's coming up today with Treasury Secretary Timothy Geithner. He's at the House Budget Committee, and we'll have that live for you at 2 p.m. Eastern. It's coming up in about 50 minutes here over on C-SPAN 3. The President released his uh, unveiled his fiscal 2012 budget proposal on Monday. It lays out a $3.73 trillion spending proposal and claims $1.1 trillion in spending cuts over the next 10 years. The proposal contains a five-year freeze on domestic discretionary spending, which the White House says will save $400 billion. You can read, read that budget proposal as well as get department-by-department department breakdowns and watch all budget hearings anytime. It's available for you at cspan.org slash budget.
While senators continue their quorum call, the latest news out of Egypt is that Egypt's health ministry says that at least 365 people were killed during the 18-day anti-government uprising. It was the first comprehensive toll given, and the health minister said that it was only a preliminary count of civilians killed and did not include police or prisoners. Meanwhile, Defense Secretary Robert Gates told a congressional panel that he cannot imagine sending U.S. ground forces as a response to civil unrest in Egypt or anywhere else in the Middle East. He told the House Armed Services Committee today that those cases are largely diplomatic challenges. Secretary Gates said that the Army's restraint during the crisis was a result of decades of U.S. investment in training and mentoring Egyptian military officers.
Senators are in a quorum call. The pending business is the FAA reauthorization bill. Meanwhile, Treasury Secretary Timothy Geithner will be back on Capitol Hill today to testify before the House Budget Committee about the Treasury Department's budget request for 2012. That'll be getting underway in about 20 minutes over on C-SPAN 3. That budget calls for an increase of $14 billion in spending to support the collection processes of the I IRS and the Dodd-Frank Wall Street reform measures. The proposed budget is about a 4% increase from 2010. Again, that gets underway at 2 p.m. Eastern over on C-SPAN 3. Senator from Vermont is recognized. Uh, I would ask that the uh, quorum call be vitiated. Without objection, so ordered. Mr. President, I want to very briefly do three things uh, this afternoon. Number one, um, there are a lot of politicians and pundits and economists who are proclaiming all over the country that the recession is over, and they have some economic models by which they determine that uh, the recession is, is, is over. Uh, I would suggest to those pundits and economists and politicians to take a look at the booklet uh, that we recently produced in my office. It's called Struggling Through the Recession, Letters from Vermont, and, and we've also received letters uh, from other states, uh, people in other states as well. Uh, and what these letters tell us, and I should tell you that we sent out a request for people to tell us as we enter the third year of this recession what is happening in their lives. And we got from my small state over 400 responses. That's a lot from a small state, and we got probably an equal number from around the rest of, of the country. Uh, and one of the problems that I had with these letters is that some of them are so painful to read that it's hard to read more than a few at a time because you really, you know, you get, a, get sick to your stomach seeing what good and decent and hardworking people uh, are going through. And I, I just want to take a few moments uh, today, Mr. President, to read just, just a few, a handful of the letters that I'm receiving from Vermont uh, in answer to the question, is the recession over? Uh, this comes from a young lady uh, from central Vermont, and she says, quote, I've been fortunate to hold on to my job throughout the past three years, especially since I have about $42,000 remaining on my school loans. And Mr. President, one of the recurring themes that we hear uh, from all over Vermont, and I suspect that it is true in New Mexico and all over this country, is a lot of young people are graduating with a heck of a lot of debt. And the jobs that they are getting are not sufficient in terms of pay to help them pay off that debt. And she writes, anyway, what I want to write isn't about me, it's about my boyfriend. 
a talented mechanical engineer who graduated with about $80,000 in school loans. So we're telling the young people of this country, go out and get an education. They're coming out with huge loans, having a hard time getting a job. He was laid off in November 2009, and it has not only caused financial hardship, but it has put all of our future plans on hold. He fortunately has temporary employment now after nearly a year of searching. But my qualm is with the high cost of education and how people in their 20s are supposed to move forward with their lives with school debt lingering over them. And that is a very significant point. Here's another one. Uh, another, this is a young man from Barrie, uh, Vermont, in the central part of our state. In 2002, I received a scholarship to St. Bonaventure University, the first in my family to attend college. Upon graduation in 2006, I was admitted to the Dickinson School of Law at Penn State University and graduated in 2009 with $150,000 of student debt. Not uncommon. In Western New York, I could find nothing better than a $10 an hour position stuffing envelopes. Another example of a young person like, graduating from college, doing all of the right things, and yet ending up with very sufficient. That's from some of the younger people. Then we got some letters from uh, middle-aged uh, people. Uh, and this is a woman, again, from the central part of our state. Quote, my husband lost his job in 2002 and has been self-employed as a carpenter ever since due to the lack of jobs in central Vermont. And I should tell you, Mr. President, the recession has had been less disastrous in Vermont than in many other parts of the country. And these are stories from a state that has not been as hit as hard as some other state, states. He's had no insurance, and we have not saved a cent since 2002. We've depleted our savings account paying for property taxes. We've been burning wood to save money heating the house. The cost of fuel for the house and vehicles puts a huge burden on making ends meet. Being self-employed is extremely challenging due to the economic situation. Again, she's touching on an issue that millions of people are aware of. Price of gas to get to work is going up. Price of home heating fuel in states like Vermont is going up. Wages are low for millions of people. How do they survive in that uh, crisis? We also have stories from older people, uh, and this is from a woman named Beth who lives in the northeastern part of our state, very rural part of Vermont. And she says, she is 69 years of age, and she says, I don't know what kind of a future my grandkids will have. How will they be educated if we can't help them? It is great that there are loans out there for education but they are being charged more for the schools than I paid for my house. They will be in debt their whole lives. So here's a woman who's worried about her grandchildren. Here's another woman. Ellen lives in Rutland County. Quote, all I can say is I still have a job for all it's worth. I feel making $8.81 an hour at 17 hours per week is ridiculous. This woman is 63 years of age. I don't bring home enough to help out with the major household expenses I used to pay half on. I'm lucky if my paycheck reaches $130 a week. By the time I pay a few bills, uh, gas up and pick up a few needed items, I'm lucky if I have any left for spending. I earned less than $8,000 this year. It's just about what I made back in the 1970s and lived better. So, the point here is, A, if folks tell you the recession is over, read some of these stories. These stories are available on my website, sanders.senate.gov. These are mostly from Vermont, but I think they touch the same themes that exist all over our country. For millions and millions of people, not only those who are unemployed, those who are underemployed, those who are working full time and not making a living wage, trust me, the recession is not over. And Mr. President, the reason I ask people to send me this letter, these letters, is that I think it's important as a Senate to understand 
that we have got to address these economic issues. When 16 percent of our people are either unemployed or underemployed or have given up looking for work, when millions more are working in inadequate wages, we cannot say that we should not be vigorously going forward in creating millions and millions of jobs that our people desperately need. Uh, Mr. President, I also wanted to say a word on Social Security. And uh, what I wanted to say is I get very tired uh, about watching the TV or hearing some of my colleagues tell me that Social Security is going bankrupt, Social Security will not be there for our kids, or Social Security is part of the serious deficit and national debt problem that we face. So let me just say a few wor words uh, on that. Number one, Social Security has existed in this country for 75 years, and it has been an enormous success. We take it for granted, but for 75 years, Social Security has paid out every nickel owed to every eligible American in good times and bad. When Wall Street collapsed a few years ago, millions of Americans lost all or part of their retirement savings when the stock market crashed. All over America during the last 10, 20 years, corporations that had promised defined benefit pension plans to their employees rescinded on that promise. People had worked for years expecting a pension from a company. That pension never came. And yet during all of that period, Social Security has paid out every nickel owed to every eligible American at minimal administrative cost. That is a pretty good record. And our job now is to make sure that Social Security is strong and vibrant 75 years from now just and, and continues to do the excellent job that it has done in the past 75 years. Now, people say Social Security is going broke. Social Security is in crisis. And a lot of people believe that because they hear it over and over again, and it's repeated in the media again, again, and again. What are the facts? So the facts are that not only is Social Security not going broke, Social Security has a 2.6 trillion dollar surplus. 2.6 trillion dollar surplus, which by the way is going to go up before it goes down. Social Security, according to the Social Security Administration and the Congressional Budget Office, can pay out every nickel owed to every eligible American for the next 25, 26, 27 years, at which point it will pay out between 75 and 80 percent of all of the benefits. The challenge that we face, therefore, is how in 25 or 30 years do we make up that 20 percent gap. That's the challenge. So Social Security is strong, will pay out every benefit owed to every eligible American for the next 25 or 30 years. And people say, oh, yeah, well, that's just worthless IOUs, that Social Security Trust Fund. Absolutely not true. The United States government, from the day of its inception, has paid its debt. Social Security is backed by the faith and credit of the United States of America. We have never yet, and I certainly hope we never will, default on our debt. So, Mr. President, the first point that I want to make is Social Security is strong. Social Security will pay out benefits for the next 26 years. And for people to come forward and say, we've got to privatize Social Security, we've got to raise the retirement age, we have to lower benefits is absolutely wrong to my mind. We made a promise to the American people regarding Social Security, and that's a promise we have to keep. Now, what also takes place in the dialogue around Washington is people lump the very serious problem of a $1.5 trillion deficit and a $14 trillion national debt with Social Security. So let's ask a very simple question. How much has Social Security contributed to our national debt? How much? And the answer is not one penny. Not one penny, because 
Social Security is not paid out from the U.S. Treasury. Social Security comes from the payroll taxes that workers and employers contribute into the Social Security Trust Fund. And that trust fund today has a $2.6 trillion surplus. So when people say, we have got a very significant national debt, and therefore we have to cut Social Security, that is absolutely a wrong thing to say. So, Mr. President, let me just say that I will do everything I can to protect a program that has worked extremely well for the American people. Now, why are we hearing all of this opposition against Social Security? Where does it come from? It doesn't come from ordinary people. They know that Social Security has been successful, that it is worth preserving, worth protecting. And by the way, as we all know, Social Security is not just there for the elderly, the retirees. It's there for people with disabilities. It's there for widows and orphans through the survivors. But where is all this opposition coming from? It's coming from two places, I think. Number one, it is coming from folks on Wall Street, from Wall Street, who are saying, gee, we could make many, many billions of dollars if we ended the Social Security system right now and Americans had to invest in retirement accounts on Wall Street. And we can make all kinds of commissions doing that work. And that's one of the areas, one of the sources of the opposition to Social Security. Second, it's from many of my very conservative Republican friends. And very honestly, they do not believe that government should be playing a role in making sure that elderly people have a secure and dignified retirement. They do not believe much in government. They don't think government should be playing a role in those areas, and they want to get government out of those areas. Now, I understand where they're coming from. It's an honest position. I strongly disagree with them. I think that in a civilized, democratic society, we have got to make sure that when you get old, it has to be guaranteed, guaranteed, as it has been for 75 years, that you are going to get the help that you need. I believe government should be playing that role. And I would remind you, Mr. President, that before Social Security was developed in the mid-30s, that 50 percent of the elderly people of our country at that point lived in poverty. Today, that number is too high, but it is 10 percent. 50 percent before Social Security, 10 percent today. That is a pretty good record. So I would respectfully disagree with my Republican friends who say, well, if people want a retirement account, let them invest in Wall Street. Let them do it through the private sector. I don't agree with that. I think Social Security has worked well for 75 years. We've got to make sure that it works well for another 75 years. And I will do everything that I can as chairman of the new, uh, deficit, the new Social Security, defending Social Security caucus to make that happen. Last point that I want to make, Mr. President, I want to talk a little bit about the deficit and our national debt. I think it is appropriate for the American people to be reminded about how we got into the very difficult situation we are in right now. And I have to tell you, I, I find it a bit amusing that some of the loudest quote-unquote deficit hawks in the Congress are precisely the same people who helped drive up the deficit and the national debt. Same people. So let's figure out try to determine how we got into the recession. Number one, in the midst of a recession by definition, less money is coming in. And that is obviously an important part of why we have the deficit and the national debt we have today. But there are other factors. Mr. President, you will recall that this country during the Bush administration uh, began two wars. War in Afghanistan, war in Iraq. The war in Iraq is estimated by the time we take care of the last veteran uh, to run up a tag of about three trillion dollars. Does anybody quite remember how we paid for that, those wars? Well, the answer is we didn't pay for those wars. Those wars were put on the credit card. President Bush said, we're going to go to war, but we don't have to worry. We don't have to worry about how we pay for them. Second area, as a result of President Bush's tax policies which have recently been extended against my vote in the Obama administration, we provided many, many, many hundreds of billions of dollars in tax breaks to millionaires and billionaires. Wealthiest people in this country are doing phenomenally well. 
their effective tax rate for the wealthiest people in this country is lower than at any time on record, in many cases lower than what working people are paying, and yet we decided, against my vote, to give them hundreds of billions of dollars in tax breaks driving up the deficit. Congress voted against my vote to bail out Wall Street. Unpaid for, drove up the deficit. Some years ago, Congress, against my vote, decided to pass an insurance company written Medicare Part D prescription drug program, very expensive program, unpaid for. So with all of these things that are unpaid for, the national debt goes up, the deficit goes up, and then our Republican friends say, oh my goodness, we have a very large deficit, what are we going to do? We're going to have to cut back on programs that are important to working people and lower income people. And I think that that is absolutely unacceptable. So the first point that I would make is I regard it as incomprehensible that there are folks who supported hundreds of billions of dollars in tax breaks for millionaires and billionaires, and then they tell us that they are concerned about the deficit and the national debt. That is absolute hypocrisy. And in my view, the United States Congress should not be about cutting back on programs for low and moderate income people after we have given huge tax breaks to the wealthiest people in this country. Uh, second of all, I think the time is long overdue that we start ending a lot of the corporate uh, tax loopholes uh, which now are preventing this country and this government from getting the revenue that we need. Before we talk about major cutbacks for our kids or for the elderly, maybe we should end the absurdity of the tax havens that exist in the Cayman Islands and Bermuda, where the wealthiest people in this country and large corporations are stashing their money away to the tune of about $100 billion a year, $100 billion a year in taxes that are not being paid because of the tax havens that exist. I would also argue that it is somewhat absurd that we have a situation where last year ExxonMobil paid no federal income taxes at all, got a $156 million rebate from the IRS after earning $19 billion in profit. So, Mr. President, what I would say is yes, deficit and national debt are very, very important issues. But it is important for us to understand how we got to where we are. It's important for us to understand that the top 1% today earn more income than the bottom 50% and have enjoyed huge, huge tax breaks. So before we start slashing programs that the middle class and working families of this country need, let's take a look at some of those issues as well. And with that, uh, Mr. President, uh, I would uh, yield the floor. Mr. Okaka.
The pending business in the Senate is still uh, federal aviation programs. No amendment votes uh, so far today. A vote uh, could happen tomorrow, though, uh, dealing with landing slots at Reagan National Airport, an issue that has delayed Senate action on the measure. An amendment by Senators Rockefeller and Hutchison uh, says that of the 24 new landing slots allowed under the bill, eight would be reserved for airlines that currently have little or no presence at the airport. The rest would go to incumbent airlines. Congressional Quarterly writes that this provision is an attempt to satisfy some Western senators, uh, particularly Arizona Republican John Kyle, whose earlier proposal uh, would have distributed any new slots based on airlines' current dominance at the airport. Uh, that type of arrangement would be a heavy advantage for the Arizona-based U.S. Airways, uh, the most heavily represented carrier at Reagan National Airport. Again, an amendment vote could happen tomorrow uh, dealing with that issue. Meanwhile, the House continues to vote now on amendments to a measure to fund the federal government for the rest of 2011. That's happening right now on C-SPAN.
President, uh, I ask you now.